Was modal jazz purposely conceptualized as an opposite to bebop? I think that's fair to say in general. Bebop music was spawned in the 1940s as a way for jazz musicians to push their abilities beyond what was happening at that point. So it typically involved a lot of chords played at fast tempos. Modal jazz was one of a number of new forms of jazz that emerged in the 1950s, loosely referred to as post-bop styles. It could certainly be seen as the opposite of bebop, with a much simpler harmonic structure and often a cooler, more laid-back vibe. Now, that was certainly true of Miles Davis, who was a pioneer in the development of modal jazz, as he was in most of the styles that evolved over the next four decades. What is the difference between a scale and a mode? So on one level, there's no difference. A mode is a scale and vice versa. What defines a scale as a mode is comparing it to another scale that contains the same notes. By starting on each note of the major scale, you generate seven modes, each of which contains the same notes. So a mode is a scale and vice versa, but depending on which note you start on, the scale sounds quite different, as does the chord that's derived from the scale. Now, one way in which you might be able to see a difference is if you think of a mode as an overall tonality, whereas a scale might be thought of as a linear line with a defined starting note. As an improviser, though, I think of a scale as a group of notes, not a line of notes. So you'll hear me refer to the D Dorian mode and the D Dorian scale somewhat interchangeably. Why do you relate D Dorian to D major rather than C major, which contains the same notes? I think most students first learn the modes as I just described them a scale that contains the same notes as another scale. For example, a major scale starting on the second note is called the second mode, which we call the Dorian mode. The D Dorian mode contains the same notes as C major, which we also call Ionian. Since each major scale generates seven different modes and there are 12 distinct keys, if you can play all your major scales starting on any note, you've effectively learned 84 different scales. But in order to use those modes to improvise, we need to think about it in another way. For the jazz improviser, a scale is a pool of notes. When you look at a set of chord changes, they tell you not only the notes of the chords, but the scales from which they're derived. The scales contain both chord tones and passing tones. The passing tones, which are often used as extensions in the chord voicing, offer additional note choices in the melodic line. It's important to understand the difference between chord tones and passing tones because emphasizing one or the other has harmonic implications. The chord tones that are extracted from a D Dorian scale are D, F, A, and C. Those notes spell a D minor 7 chord. We want the root of the scale to match the root of the chord, and the same with the other chord tones. So in this case, the root of the scale and the chord is D. The third of the scale in the chord is F natural, and so on. If we think of the D Dorian scale as a C major scale starting on D, well, F is the fourth note of the C major scale, but it's the flat third of a D major scale, and it's also the flat third of a D minor chord. The fact that the D Dorian scale contains the same notes as C major is almost a coincidence in this context. Now, to understand the D minor 7 chord as derived from a D Dorian scale, we need to view the mode in relation to D major. In other words, Think of a mode in relation to the major scale that is based on the same root rather than the major scale that contains the same notes. Now, admittedly, this is more work. If you think of modes in the traditional way, then just by knowing a single major scale, you can play seven different modes. If you think of them as alterations of the major scale based on the same root, then you need to know seven different major scales to generate the seven modes of C major. But by doing it that way, you see the relationship between the scales and the chords, which is at the heart of jazz improvisation. How do you remember the various modes in all the keys? That seems very daunting. See, one of the things about key fluency is that whatever you learn about one key applies to all the others. The notes are different, but the intervallic relationships stay the same. So it's not really a matter of learning 84 different modes. You learn 12 major scales, or 15 if you want to include the enharmonic equivalents, and then you learn the alterations that define the modes, and you apply them to each scale. Lydian raises the fourth note of the scale, which we could call a sharp 4 or a sharp 11. The chord tones, 1, 3, 5, and 7, aren't changed. So Lydian produces a major 7 chord just like the major scale, also called Ionian. Now, Lydian works well over the 4 major chord in any key because the raised fourth note ties the scale to the key. In other words, the B natural in an F Lydian scale is in the key signature of C, but not in the key signature of F. The next mode to learn would be Mixolydian, which lowers the seventh note. This scale produces a dominant seven chord, one, three, five, and flat seven. Now the five chord in every key is a dominant chord, and five chords occur frequently in functional harmony. 
Less so in modal harmony, but I'll have more to say on that coming up. The next mode would be Dorian. You start with the Mixolydian, and then you lower the third as well as the seventh. The Dorian scale produces a minor seven chord, one, flat three, five, and flat seven, built on the second degree of the major scale. Actually, three of the modes produce minor seven chords, but the other two, Aeolian and Phrygian, contain alterations other than just the flat three and the flat seven. At this point, I've talked about four modes. The major scale, also called the Ionian mode, the Lydian mode, which contains a sharp four, the Mixolydian mode, which contains a flat seven, and the Dorian mode, which contains a flat seven and a flat three. If you know a major scale, how hard is it to change one note in that scale, or even two? And if this is as far as you went with the modes, you'd already have a lot to work with because you've got the 2-5-1 progression covered with the four major chord thrown in for good measure. Now, there are only three more major modes, and to understand how the alterations are added to them, it's useful to refer to the circle of fifths, which some people might call the circle of fourths or a cycle of fifths or fourths because going down a fifth takes you to the same note as going up a fourth and vice versa. Taking the key of C as an example, Mixolydian lowers the seventh note, which is B flat. Dorian adds the flat three, which is E flat. E flat is a fifth below B flat. So what's a fifth below E flat? A flat, which is the lowered six in the key of C. A scale with a lowered seven, a lowered three, and a lowered six is called Aeolian. Aeolian is the sixth mode, and it produces a minor seven chord built on the sixth degree of the major scale. Now what's a fifth below A flat? D flat which is the lowered two in the key of C. A scale with a lowered seven, a lowered three, a lowered six, and a lowered two is called Phrygian. Phrygian is the third mode, and it produces a minor seven chord built on the third degree of the major scale. Now finally, a fifth below D flat is G flat, which is the lowered fifth in the key of C. A scale with a lowered seven, a lowered third, a lowered six, a lowered second, and a lowered fifth is called Locrian. Locrian is the seventh mode, and it produces a minor seven flat five chord built on the seventh degree of the major scale. This may all still sound overwhelming if you're near the starting line of all of this stuff, but if you're going to run a marathon, you don't think about the 26 miles ahead of you. You just start running, or even walking. I know that the Ionian, Dorian, and Mixolydian modes refer to the 2-5-1 progression. Are there other modes that jazz players use frequently? Those three scales produce major seven, dominant seven, and minor seven chords. I refer to those as the big three, because they make up the two, five, one progression, and also because the majority of chords can be slotted into one of those three general categories. That's why I suggested that these are the modes you should focus on initially. Along with Lydian, they're also the simplest modes with the least number of alterations. The other modes come into play when other diatonic chords appear in the progression. When a minor seven chord is built on the sixth degree, the flat six of the Aeolian scale ties it to the key. The Locrian scale, built on the seventh degree, is the only one that produces a minor seven flat five chord, so that's a pretty clear cut choice. The Phrygian mode is probably used less often than the others. It might make sense on a three minor chord, but since that chord is typically paired with a six dominant chord, that might suggest something other than Phrygian. The bottom line remains that if you can navigate through 251 in every key with an understanding of those three modes, you are well on your way to being a capable improviser. Although we use the Dorian scale for impressions and so what, couldn't we use any of the modes relating to the key signatures of C and D flat? The answer is yes, and that sort of goes to the heart of modal improvisation. In a functional harmony situation like 2-5-1, all three chords are derived from the same group of notes, which are used to create the Dorian, Mixolydian, and Ionian modes. Although all those notes are available on each chord, the prominence of specific notes changes, with some acting as chord tones and others as passing tones or extensions. If we want to misquote George Orwell, we can say that all notes are equal, but some notes are more equal than others. Now, in a modal tune, the chord tones are generally not used to create the voice leading that defines a chord progression. So in that regard, we could say that the notes of the scale are more equal in a modal context. Therefore, all the modes are available, or to my mind, more accurately put, all seven notes are available. Does the interval of a tritone between the flat third and the natural sixth in a Dorian scale have any impact on why it's more commonly used than the Aeolian scale? The tritone interval in a dominant seventh chord between the major third and the flat seven is significant because it creates an instability that makes that chord want to resolve. 
The tritone interval that you're describing between the third and the sixth doesn't exist in a minor seven chord, although it does exist in the scale. It would exist in a minor six chord, although a C minor six chord could be heard as an F7 if you changed the root. As to the question of why Dorian scales are used more often than Aeolian scales, well, I'd say that's because two chords appear more frequently than six chords. But that doesn't really address the question in a modal context, since the chords aren't really functioning as two chords or six chords. One thought is that the natural six is used as an extension on minor chords, much more often than the flat six would be. If you want to specify a mode in the chord symbol, how do you do that? I guess it might be possible to put something in the chord symbol that denotes a specific mode. For example, if you wrote D minor seven with a flat 13, that would suggest the Aeolian mode. But the simplest and clearest way would be just to write the name of the mode next to the chord symbol. If you see a minor chord symbol, how do you know which mode to use? Now that's a good question, because there are three modes that produce minor seven chords, and there's one that produces a minor seven flat five. In functional harmony, the position of the chord within the chord progression and the key of the tune determine which scale is the most appropriate. If we see the chord progression D minor seven to G dominant seven to C major seven, D minor is functioning as the two chord, and D Dorian contains all the notes of C major, so Dorian would be the logical choice. If we see the chord progression D minor seven to G minor seven to C dominant seventh to F major seventh, then D minor is functioning as the six chord, and D Aeolian contains all the notes of F major. So Aeolian is the logical choice in that case. Now you'll note that both D Dorian and D Aeolian contain the chord tones of D minor seven. So you still wouldn't be too far off if you chose the wrong scale. Now in a modal context, the chords don't necessarily work together in the same way. They tend to stand on their own for a while. When the chord does change, it can really go anywhere. So it may be less clear which mode is most appropriate, but it also might be less important when the chord isn't functioning as part of a progression with a defined direction. The melody could offer a clue. Both impressions and so what contain the notes of D Dorian in the melody. In the case of So What, I think you need to consider the bass line and the specific voicing of the horns to be inherent parts of the melody. In modal tunes, as with other kinds of tunes, the melody does, or it should, exert influence on the improvisation. How do you determine the key signature of a modal tune? In modal tunes, as with other kinds of tunes, the last chord is probably a reliable indicator of the home tonality, but perhaps less so when it comes to the key signature. The final chord for impressions, and so what, is D minor. Well, the normal key signature for D minor is one flat, since it's the relative minor of F major. But since the melodies both contain B naturals, well, that suggests a key signature of C. The chords in a modal tune don't typically work in sequence to define an overall key center, as much as each chord creates a specific tonality that might be quite different in terms of key from the next chord. So in that regard, the key signature may be less relevant on a modal tune. Why doesn't the key signature on the lead sheet change when the chord changes? On a modal tune like Impressions, where there are only two different key centers, changing the key signature for the B section might make sense, because it would make the modulation clear and reduce the number of accidentals. But most tunes will go through a number of key centers, and it would actually be harder to read if the key signature kept changing. Now on a standard tune, the key signature exerts influence on the entire tune. And one of the things I suggest is to try improvising on a new tune knowing only the key, and the melody, but not the chord changes. That puts you in touch with the big picture. It also emphasizes the use of the melody as a guide for improvisation. On most standard tunes, the melody is largely or entirely diatonic, even as the harmony moves through different key centers. The way a great composer ties together disparate harmony with what is often a very simple melody is genius, and it's somewhat at odds with the notion that improvisation is a complex art form. Now that said, Sometimes you have to wade through complexity to find the simplicity that lies within. On a modal tune, just thinking of the overall key might not work as well because the key centers may be radically different. For example, if you try to improvise on impressions using only the D Dorian scale, you're gonna wind up with some quizzical note choices on the E flat minor section because those two key centers have only two notes in common. Is the form of a modal tune determined by the chord progression? So modal tunes are no different than other tunes in this regard. There are a set number of chords and a melody that's designed to be played over them. During the improvised section, the chords are played in the same order as they are during the melody. The goal of the improviser, then, is to compose new melodies to fit an existing chord progression. So you can say that the form is determined by the chord progression, although since the melody is designed to work with the chords, it could also be seen as the delineator of form.
Does the melody of a modal tune exert less influence on the improvisation than the melody of a standard tune? While I hesitate to ever diminish the importance of melody, this might be fair to say, in that given the way the chords flow one to the next in functional harmony, the melody acts like connective tissue. Although you could say the same thing happens in modal tunes, because the chords are spread further apart, the melody has less of a role to play in terms of charting a path through them, and more in terms of establishing the overall tonality of the moment. Now another aspect might be that the extended harmony expands the opportunity to venture further afield from the melody. Is the correct melody for impressions the one where the B section is the same as the A section, or the Coltrane version where the bridge is different? So if we're going to define it in those terms, a composer's interpretation of his own composition would logically be considered correct. In the case of my videos, I transpose the A section up a half step for the B section because to my mind, that makes the harmonic relationship clearer in that the harmony in the B section is exactly the same as the A section, a single minor seven chord transposed up a half step. Also, the structure of the melody on the A section makes for a great scale pattern exercise as I demonstrate in the video. Now I guess you could say the same thing about Coltrane's melody on the bridge, but the wider intervallic structure would make it tougher to play in all keys. Do jazz musicians ever simply call for a vamp on a mode instead of a specific modal tune? So I'm working on memory here, but I recall an instructional video from John McNeil in which he humorously described a one note scale that he called the pedestrian scale. The problem, he said, was that it got boring. So he added another note. Now offhand, I can't think of a tune with fewer than two chords. So by calling a specific tune, rather than just saying vamp on D minor, we have some sort of agreed upon harmonic framework. Now there are definitely tunes in which the blowing or the improvising is over a single chord. And you might call for a vamp as an introduction to a tune. But I would say a listener is likely to find a performance more interesting if it's based on more than a single chord. I've found that one reason for avoiding what are termed avoid notes, for example the natural four on a dominant chord, is because they give away the upcoming harmony. Is this less true in modal jazz, where forward moving harmony is not as relevant? It does make sense, in light of what I've just said about voice leading and the idea that notes are more equal in modal harmony. It also relates to the question about why Dorian is used more frequently than Aeolian. When a Dorian scale is played over a minor seven chord, there are no avoid notes. Every note of the scale sounds harmonious against the chord. Does it make sense for a soloist to imply a cadence like 2-5-1 within a single modal chord? In these videos and others, I've talked about the fact that the two chord and the five chord can be considered somewhat interchangeable by the improviser. They're both derived from the same pool of notes and they share two chord tones. A 2-5 on its own doesn't really create a sense of resolution, so you can kind of go back and forth. But when you go from the five chord to the one chord, you do create resolution. And the absence of dominant resolution is a key difference within modal harmony. You might say that improvising on modal chords is like existing in a state of suspended animation. So implying a cadence like five to one might make less sense. If minor chords imply the use or availability of related dominant chords, for example, D minor seven and G seven, could you also use a G altered dominant scale? While D Dorian and G Mixolydian contain the same notes, making them somewhat interchangeable, the G altered dominant scales introduce new and non-diatonic notes into the mix. So they won't be as easily interchangeable in the same way. More to the point, altering a dominant chord increases the sense of resolution, which might set up an unrealized expectation in the ear of the listener. Does the minimal appearance of chords in a modal tune suggest a sparse melodic approach? Well, yes, it might. If you listen to Miles' solo on So What, that's a good example of taking that kind of approach. In general, the music on Kind of Blue, which is considered a watershed album in the evolution of modal jazz, could be considered sparse or minimalist. On the other hand, if you listen to Coltrane playing Impressions in the 1960s or Michael Brecker a few years later, you'll hear very much the opposite approach. When you improvise on a chord progression, do you think of the modes associated with each chord? So the answer to this is no, but. It's akin to asking, do you think about the chords when you improvise? Now, I always respond to this with the question, do you think about the words when you talk? You know the meanings of the words, and somewhere in the recesses of your brain lie the rules of grammar that determine how the words are put together. But because you're fluent in the language, you don't have to consciously think about the words the same way that someone would who's just learning the language. Now, the purpose of musical theory is to inform your ear, to help you understand and predict how each note will sound relative to the chord of the moment and to the chord progression as a whole. 
The goal is to reach the point that the information is absorbed into the subconscious so that your conscious thought goes more to the creative and responsive aspects of playing music. Can bebop language be used on modal chords? In the videos, I demonstrated the use of the dominant bebop scale over the related minor chords. The addition of the major 7 as a passing tone in the Mixolydian scale adds chromaticism, just like the flat 5 does in the blues scale. The bebop language is essentially the addition of chromaticism to lines that are based on chord and scale tones. Although the chromatic approach and connecting notes make the lines rather complex, introducing many points of tension and resolution, they do clearly define the harmony, which is mostly based on 2-5-1. So yes, bebop language can be used on modal tunes, and for a good example, listen to Cannonball Adderley playing on So What. Can you play outside the tonality on a modal tune? In some ways, modal music is ideal for venturing outside of the harmony because you've got lots of time to do it. But in my experience, students often want to try playing outside before they've learned to play really solidly inside. There's no harm in trying, but unless you're really clear about where you're going, it may not make much sense to the listener. As a specific example, if you were to try and play outside the harmony on the D minor 7 chord on Impressions, well, it might just sound like you went to the E flat minor 7 at the wrong time. Is it possible to play modally over a chord progression, meaning using one mode over multiple chords? So in general, finding a single scale that works over multiple chords is a good strategy. For example, you can improvise over 2-5-1 by thinking only of the key, as defined by the Ionian or major scale that produces the one chord. Now, I don't know if that's the same thing as playing modally, but it reduces or simplifies the amount of information that your brain is trying to process. That allows you to focus more on what you hear than what you think, and on how you play rather than what you play.